and welcome everybody to the Masterclass series. Very excited tonight because we have the gorgeous Jacqueline Hellier here, who's a sex and relationship therapist. So welcome. Lovely to be here. Thanks for housekeeping me. And uh, we were just actually chatting about an interesting subject, which is um, the whole aspect around men and women, you know, because I, I'm, I'm a little bit guilty of that. Uh, men are different to women. And so therefore there's a different response. But you actually had another point of view on that. <laughs> Absolutely, I do. It's not that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. We're both from Earth, right? Yeah. We have so much more in common than we have difference. And once you've talked to thousands of people like I have in intimate detail about themselves, you, you start to realise there's no difference. Yeah. There are some women who are really emotionally constipated and can't express themselves and there are men who start crying the moment they walk into the consulting room. You know, in fact, if anything, I've come to realise that men are actually more emotional, probably. They just, perhaps some of them aren't as capable of expressing it. What's the thing, though, what's the thing, sorry, I have to jump in. What's the thing where there's, is there a different thing with men that they want to fix things versus we share it? You know, that whole conversation. No, 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 no. You see, if we have time, we can go into the whole attachment theory thing, but it depends on how you're brought up. Because what one thing that we've really realised about relationships, and I want to stress that the thing about relationships is that it is about a dynamic. It's about the us. There's the you, the me, and then the us is this third entity. And it's the sum of the dynamic between the two people. So it's never just, I've got to own my own stuff and it's, it's actually, well, that's an element of it, but then it's also about the dynamic because generally what we do is we repeat in our primary adult relationships the same type of attachment patterns that we learn as infants and small children with our primary caregivers. Um, so if you, if you had a relationship with a significant parent where you didn't have the space to speak, where your emotions weren't really valued, you know, your parents might have been great, you know, really encouraged you academically and in sport, for, you know, but they may not well have been there for you emotionally. So you don't learn to, it's not a safe space for you to be able to express. Now, I see as many women who have that kind of upbringing as men do, mm -hmm. right? Now, the converse is that, is when you grow up in a family where, you know, you've got to make an effort to get your, your parents' attention and they're often not there for you. And then when they are there for you, you're annoyed with them because they're there and they're not, you know, you get this real, ang this is the angry kind of relating that, that often people have. And, you know, women have that, heaps of that, men have that, because I want to connect, I want to connect. You're there, you're not there, you're there, you're not there. And quite frequently, people actually match, they choose someone who's the opposite. Mm. Yeah. So if you're sort of more of this kind of ah, sort of a person, you'll pick someone who's strong, who's solid, who's there for you, who's reliable, right? Whereas if you're more that sort of a person, you're like, wow, this person's really exciting and they do all of this and yeah. But over time, that same thing that initially attracted you to that person can become really annoying for you. Isn't that interesting? So why, really? does, that, why does that happen? Well, because you start becoming complacent for a start. Mm. You stop actually noticing. So all those things initially were so interesting about the person. Yeah, it's as you get to know them and you see them in, in their entirety, then you're going to see more of it. It's not just all the good stuff that you see initially. It's funny because we've had a few conversations which I've loved about relationship and we yeah. could talk for hours, of course. We could indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I spend about eight hours a day talking about relationships. So yes. You got to, so I mean, really, for tonight, with um, who's who's watching is I like the questions which we had here, which I'm just going back to here, which was um, how to create. I mean, this is a big question. The best yeah. advice to create a loving relationship and fulfilling. Yeah. And I know one of you, one of the things that you talked about, which fascinated me, was that third person like the relationship is a third were you talking third about? entity yes yeah yeah so anyway yes what what would you like to say about that well there is the you there is the me and then there is the us and to have a successful us you really need to be experts on each other right so you do need to do your own work because you need to know who you are and how you tick and what triggers you and what your personality is good and bad because yeah. you're never going to be perfect you're just not sorry maybe several thousand more incarnations. I don't know, but you're never going to be perfect. All right, so you need to know who you are. But equally, you need to know who your partner is. 
yeah. because he's the same. He's not perfect. He's got his foibles. He's got his personalities. He's got his differences. And you need to know how he ticks so that you can relate to him in a way that's going to work for him. Right. And he needs to know how you tick so that he can relate to you in a way that works for you. Because too often two people are not relating to the other in a way that works for them. They're relating to the other in a way that works for themselves. Mm. And then getting really, really frustrated. So to go back to the example we used before, if your partner is more of this, what we call emotionally avoidant type, and you're sort of more, the more intense, I want to connect, I want you, I want time, I want everything with you. If you start relating to them like that, you're going to drive them further away. They're going to close up more. Right. Okay. Yes. Similarly, if they try relating to you in this sort of closed off way, then you're going to go, uh, you're not there for me. I, I don't know anything about you. You know, tell me anything about yourself. What, I, I don't know what's going on for you. And then he's, you know, he or she, because as I said, there's just as many women like that. Blah, blah. Just give me, give me space, give me space, give me space. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. So what, so what is the, um, so you, when you're with sessions with people, mm -hmm. so you then, I mean, one of the things is to get them to talk to each other about what their needs are and how they relate. And is there any tip or something to help when someone doesn't want to talk about it or do that? What do you say? Well, one of the key things is actually learning to listen to the other person. Mm. Because that has to come first. Because if you can't listen to the other person, if you, then, then, then you can't actually express what your needs are because you can't hear each other. And you're just going to become frustrated. So before expressing your needs, yes, you do need to know what they are. <laughs> Can I just add, if there is one difference between men and women, it's often that women don't know what their needs are, right? But that's a social thing, not a biological thing, yes? Yes. But there's no point knowing what your needs are if your partner's not capable of hearing that because your dynamic between the two of you, no one's fault, it's your dynamic, isn't capable of enabling that. Right. So yeah. the first thing, I mean, is that a big issue in relationships? Is yes, it's for huge. For listening, right, yeah. It's and, huge. And what's the step then before that to enable the listening? Is there anything, is it just acknowledging that there's an issue or? Um... You have to create space. Now, often at the beginning of a relationship, people are actually naturally quite good at this. They say, like, it's really interesting. You want to find out about the person. And, and, and they're generally safe, even for those more avoided types, because it's new. There's nothing at stake. There's nothing to lose. So it's quite easy. And for the ones who tend to be more intense and needy, they can sit back a little bit because, you know, they're getting lots of stuff. Yes. So early on, that's quite easy to do. But over time, you're going to start falling into these, these patterns. Every little thing that starts annoying you starts accumulating until it's become this huge thing. So ideally, before you even start meeting someone, you need to know who you are so that you know what your triggers are, what your challenges are, and to understand how different the other person could potentially be. So when you notice him acting a little bit strange, you start, you get curious. You start going, oh, that is really interesting. Mm. Why, would, why would you be like that? Why would you have that thought? Why would you have that response? Rather than just thinking that there's something weird about them. Yes. Because if there's something, and yes, I will admit, women do this more than men. They're just kind of like, oh, he's an asshole. Or, oh, he's just like, oh, all men are like that. Oh, and they just don't listen. Oh, he's just done. Yeah? As though all men are this blanket thing. And then they wonder why the same thing keeps happening. Right. Okay. So Men do it too. Men do it too. Or women. Oh, they were crazy. I know. I, I know. I, one thing is women um, manipulate uh, men with emotionality. Is but that women do. They're right because women do. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> because we're not trained. And I'm not blaming women for this any more than I blame women. It's our society. We are not brought up to be honest. We've got all of this stuff going on in the back of our mind. The way women in particular, men do it too, right? But women are particularly bad at it. They don't speak straight. They're always kind of talking around. And the guy's just going, what? Just, just be straight with me. Tell me what's going on. And she's oh, now you're getting aggressive with me. And he's like, what the fuck am I supposed to do? Oh, well, isn't that interesting? So it is that first space of being able to, you know, like, yeah, feel safe with the male. I think that's, as you're saying too, it's probably the initial society stuff where there's this other stuff. And enable him to feel safe with you 
Mm-hmm. Right. Because none of us are safe with it. Other people are not safe emotionally. Yeah. And unless we grow up with the most perfect parents and bless our parents, they do their best. Yeah, but it's a rare person who grows up to be very self-actualized and emotionally strong, capable. Very few. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, 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 okay, in, in relationship, mm. um, people are having trouble. That's a great thing is to really allow the space to be able to listen, which is awesome. Um, is there something to look out for if you are going into, you touched on that just a bit, um, going into a relationship? And it's hard yeah. because, my God, we're, I mean, I'm 54 and I'm still evolving and changing. I feel yeah. like I'm 19. So how do you then go, oh, my God, I need someone who's going to evolve a change with me? And then how can you count on that? How do you kind of look for someone who is going to be, I mean, what do you kind of, what do you think about all that? <laughs> well, you can't. Yeah. You yeah. can't, you can't, you can't predict the future and you can't project onto a potential partner your fantasy ideal of who he should be. Yeah. You have to, there is an element of loving unconditionally. You have to accept him for who he is. You've got to learn who this beautiful person is, yeah. where his weaknesses are, where his fears are. And again, this is something that a lot of women do in our society. We're chronic at it. Is It's almost like we put men on a pedestal and then get really resentful about it. It's kind of like men sort of have their acts together. So if he falters in any way, it's because he's an asshole. It's because, you know, men are just arrogant pricks. And we don't realise that we're actually putting them in that place. Yeah. And that we are just as scary to them as we might think they are to us. Okay? Yeah. You have to think about that little boy. Think about your own male children or relatives or the little boy. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. When you think that that's inside all of us and that's what, you know, that's the part of us that's yearning for connection. Yeah. And then if you keep in mind that as a boy, he was probably brought up to be told, you know, lads shouldn't have emotions, you know, boys don't cry, don't be like that. And then think that as an adolescence, the onus was on him as the man to make all the approaches. He's been rejected. He's been rejected. Men have been rejected thousands of times by the time they get to adulthood yeah. all the time. Yeah. yeah. And we forget about that. And now we get really pissed off at them if they make an approach to us that we don't like. Right. Yeah, because they're supposed to be perfect. They're the all-powerful ones because we've given them that power. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if they stuff it up in any way, well, then we're going to get indignant on our high horse. <laughs> and we're going to lump them into this huge thing that this is what men are like. And here's this poor guy who's just like, I don't know. And men are coming to me in droves these days going, I don't know what to do. Well, I mean, that's a great thing to talk about. So what yeah. are the issues? Yes, talk more about what issues relate yes. to Yes. Well, we are talking about it already. Yes. As I said, women are chronically bad at knowing what they need. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is part of our cultural upbringing. It's not men's fault. <laughs> yeah. It's our cultural history that women weren't supposed to have needs. We were supposed to be this ever-suffering, ever-giving kind of Madonna figure. Right? Yeah. It's still very strong in our psyches it's only very recently it's only in the last generation or so that this has started changing it's very new it's not because men are assholes it's our social structure and if we just lump all men as being bad yeah. we're never going to get anywhere it's a fight it's going to be a fight yeah well i'm hoping that because of there's so much kind of conversation around inclusivity yeah. and equality yeah. Moment, yes. be an energetic shift on that. Yes, as well. but yeah. what we need to do is we need to say what we do want. Mm. That I think a lot of women, don't, that's exactly as you yes. say, you go, well, I don't know what's actually going to make me happy. I mean, I don't know yeah. what I want because well, I want if you show. don't know, how oh, the hell is he oh, supposed no, to know? That's right, yeah, yeah. But I say yeah. a lot of women is that question, you know, I work with branding with a lot of clients. Yeah. And that yeah. issue is still on a fundamental level. Mm-hmm. What are my values? What do I want? Yes. Um, so the question's coming up now, which is great. So yes. it's like, okay, what does that look like? And what does it mean now with the person I'm in relationship with? You yeah. know, how does that play out? Um, has there been a big kind of change, you know, because you're seeing the issues? Is there anything in particular that has come up in the last 12 months or, you know, that's different than normal? There, there are more men coming to me, particularly young ones, saying, I don't know what to do. Right. And I personally, now this is just my own belief, I actually think that this is partly why there's more of the hookup culture. 
because it's not safe to be open and emotional. Oh. Right? Oh. Like in a way women, and this is a good thing. Don't think I'm saying this is a bad thing. Women are getting better at saying no. So I don't want that. Right? But what the guys are getting is like, fuck, this is more fraught than it ever was. I can really fuck up badly here. So, and because no one's been taught how to do this more subtle communication and really understand and evolve a relationship together, because in the past we just fell into roles and now, you know, women and a lot of men too, you know, the men are actually saying, thank fucking Christ, we want our women to open up and tell us what they want. But now we're having to craft new relationships, individual relationships. We can't go into those old patterns of relationship because that's not what we want. The men don't want it any more than the women want it. Mm. Yeah, the men don't want the little woman at home while he's out, you know, slaving away and bringing in all the money and never spending any time with his children and, you know, dying of stress or a heart attack at a young age. The men don't want that. I'm talking generally here. Maybe there are some who do, right? Yeah. But I don't think most do want that. So what the skills that we're having to learn as individuals and as a society is how to pay attention to our partner. Yeah. How to co-create something that will be individual and unique to us as a unique individual couple. Mm, I love that because it's just so true, that stereotype. Yeah. You need to be that role, you need to be that, and the expectations just become so overwhelming and you kind of forget that, oh, we're allowed to actually yes. create our own space. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And when we get that, as women particularly, particularly since the audience here, I think is predominantly women. It is so empowering. And that's where the power is. Yeah. The power is not because too many women try to be masculine like men. They try to be closed off and aggressive. And that does not work in a relationship. It might work in the workplace, but even then I don't think it works all that well. Yeah, so I think that's, that, that's, I mean, that's what I'd like to challenge. Yeah, but what, every, yeah but what everyone is searching for is this genuine connection. Mm, mm. To be able to create a safe space with someone, particularly with your beloved. I mean, it's very hard in relationships too with social media, and I know we've talked about that before, that there, there mm. is that kind of how do I connect with someone where it's so kind of online and you don't even have the eye contact or that they don't, so they're missing a whole kind of... Yeah. You can't do it. Yeah. You can't do it because human communication is so subtle. You know, these, these tiny little movements in our faces all the time, which is why you should never use Botox, right? Yeah. Because you're cutting out. I hate it when I get clients with Botox. I miss so much of what's going on, yeah? yeah. So, I, yeah. You said to me something which was awesome the other time yeah. is when yeah. women have Botox with babies. Yes. You miss a huge connection with the mother, which I yeah. thought was just priceless comment, right? Yeah, you? it's a growing problem. Yeah. for babies because babies learn to communicate they learn to connect by paying very close attention to their mother's faces oh. <laughs> yeah it's true, it's true. great advice. Yeah. and we're and as infants and when you think how we develop as as infants we can't speak we don't understand the words yet yeah so yeah. we're paying attention to face you know infants are very clued into you know, emotion here and tone of voice. And, and it's the same as adults too. And that's why it's so important that even though in our culture we're brought up to really value words and words are very important and being rational and words and all of that. But the bulk of our communication is not words. Mm. The bulk of our communication is things like facial expression. It's tone of voice. It's called prosody. It's the way we speak. Mm. it's about so if you want to talk to your partner for instance around something that could be emotionally challenging which is most things yeah, <laughs> you need to you need to focus on your tone of voice you need to start with a gentle intro darling darling how's your day been oh come and have a cup of tea let's have a chat yeah 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 and you have to be, and this is where so many people fall down, if things start getting a bit challenging, and this is probably the master skill, is as things get challenging, to continue to be able to pay attention to what's going on for him, not just to fall into your own stuff because then we start getting defensive. Yeah. And it's really tricky. Yes, and it's ugh, because you can feel yourself. You get what's called upregulated. The anxiety is rising, yeah, and that's when all of our defences come into play. 
including yeah. all of those belief systems. Ah, oh, men are all assholes. Ah, oh, men can't listen. Oh, I've got to be tough against a man. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be able to go, no, no, this is my beloved. It's going to create space. You're going to start doing what he needs as much as what you need. And ideally, he'll, he's doing the same back to you. Yeah, it is hard when it gets into that space where it yeah. escalates to really you could be just saying gobbledygook, but you're both in your little boxes, do you know what I mean? Which yeah. is, I mean, he knows my husband has the sense to kind of, he goes, you know, that's it. It's let's talk about it or let's have a breather or re yeah. reframe everything. Where yeah. I like, I have to get finished. <laughs> I just want to yeah. get finished and that was, yeah. you know. So he actually, if I can say it, is actually more in tune than you are in those moments. Yeah, absolutely. and often one person will be more than the other. Mm. Yeah, he can see that you are upregulated to the point where you're actually not in control of what's going on. Yeah, you're flooded. You're emotionally flooded, and you're the type of person that, as you get emotionally flooded, more and more words will come out. You get more needy. Yeah, oh, I got to get something. I know that's exactly what happens. Just Chances are he's the opposite. When he gets emotionally flooded, he just go. He gets um, brain fog. He goes numb. He shuts down. That's exactly right. Yeah. Just so you know, if you was listening, um, what happened, I was just talking about that I just had a process where I discovered the way I connected with my partner was through anger because of my dad's anger. And it was really, it's been cathartic to actually see that. So everything that you're talking about just makes so much sense when we own who we are and how we yeah. relate. And then it takes them off being the bad guy or, you know, wrong or whatever, you know. Yeah. So yeah. Work. Yes. So ideally for people, I mean, I think everyone should do couples therapy or do couples training because it's not easy and it's not natural, yes. but we're sort of thrown into relationships without any training whatsoever. And often we don't get help until things are disastrous. You know, so often people come to me and they're like, God, I wish we'd come to see you ages ago. Like it, a lot of it's not that difficult when you actually understand what it is or, you know, mm. they come to retreats and they're like, Oh my God, it just completely reframed the way we see each other and relate and it's it's a beautiful thing when you get it it's a beautiful thing and i i feel really sad that you know because it's actually not that hard to help it's it's not that difficult but because we don't have the training we don't know what to do and there are look i mean that safe space of finding someone who you can trust to go to so it's great to actually have met you and to recommend you to people because it is hard like there's yeah. not many because i mean to be no honest, there's not many trained experienced couples therapists or coaches yeah it's only actually quite recently that couples therapy was seen as something different from individuals right because even yeah. just having that conversation tonight where you have i think for people to have that third person yeah. going okay because we, yeah. we're the judge of everything and so we kind of get our yeah. viewpoint gets distorted a lot on that yeah yeah, I mean, even couples therapists have couples therapists. I mean, yeah. my partner and I, we've got a couples therapist because sometimes it's just some stuff that it's just too emotionally loaded for us to be able to effectively sort out ourselves. Yeah. And he knows us really well, our therapist. And we're like, hey, we need to come in and sort some stuff out because we just, look, we probably could do it ourselves, but we just, let's just get to the chase. Well, I've just learned the value of being coached. Like, yeah. I like a business car and it is just priceless you know like just yeah. having that i mean even though i've done it for people it's just to have that person to go to and to check in and to be accountable for things yeah that person's been well, yeah them. and they're completely you know they're, they're judgment free all yeah. all they're there for is to help you see stuff <laughs> understand yeah. each other you know and so when i'm working with a couple i'm holding space for them so that they can actually kind of let go a little bit and just be in the process rather than having to manage it at the same time Yes, that yeah. difference. Um, yeah. one okay. of the, and I love it. No, I love it. This is fantastic. What is the other thing, which I know has been a big thing for a lot of my friends and, and uh, colleagues, actually, is about teenagers and, yes. you know, relationships and their sexuality. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and can you just kind of talk about that a little bit? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it comes up all the time, all yep. the time. Okay, now... The best way to bring up your children to have a healthy, positive attitude to relationships and sexuality is to model it. Right. That is absolutely the number one best thing to do. Go. Okay? Which means sort your own stuff out first and do it at a very early age because from the moment they are born... <laughs> They are learning stuff from you. They are learning about relationships from you. They are learning about how you relate to, between you. They are seeing how man approaches woman 
right? Which is why you've got this view of how men think of women because of your father, right? Yeah. They are seeing what women think of man. They are seeing how woman and man relate because the mother represents woman and the father represents man. Yeah. Your role in that is so important, yeah? Yeah. Now, I'm going to share something about my life, and I don't actually share that much. I'm a pretty private person, but this is because people are often saying to me, how did you get to do this work? Like, were your parents really open sexually and all this sort of stuff? I'm like, no. <laughs> they were very kind of conventional, you know, Catholic upbringing, you know. But my father respected my mother so much. Mm. Like, he respected my mother. I grew up knowing that man respects woman. And as a girl growing up, that meant I grew up feeling worthy. Yes, gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. And I was very fortunate that in that era it wasn't as common, but I think there's always been, you know, and actually in his parents, so we're going back quite some time, Grandma Nana's 100 years old at the moment and still going strong. Oh, wow. Yeah. Awesome. And it was the same thing. Yeah. Like there was a really, and it wasn't just that the man respected the woman, it, was, it went both ways. Now, I have no idea what my grandparents' sex life was, I know far too much about my parents' sex life because ever since I've become a sex therapist, the dad wants to talk about it. I'm like, really seriously, you know, like just give me a break. But they do, and I always knew growing up that they did have a healthy, regular sex life. You know, they were affectionate with each other. They were attentive to each other. They, you yeah, know, they weren't perfect. And, you know, I know they had problems and they nearly split up once and all this sort of stuff. But this is really key. And I say that because that's what you're modelling. Yeah. And so it's not even the details as such because I, know, because I know when people go, how do you kind of talk about or help your child or, you know, feel healthy towards relationships or, and I, absolutely I can see it. It is role modelling and looking and doing your own development, self-development on it. It's interesting. I mean, yeah. it's, because it's, if you wait, sorry, go on. Oh, no, I was just going to. So because if you're until they're teenagers to start talking to them about sexuality and relationships, well, A, teenagers don't want to talk to their parents about that stuff anyway, right? You've got to talk to them when they're younger because yeah. it's too late, yeah. right? They, they don't want to know. They don't want to talk to you about personal stuff at that age. They just don't, yeah? So you've got to get it in earlier. Yeah. So where, what would be a good age that you did if you had to talk to kids about... I mean, that's the thing. Like, I'm, I'm, I mean, my son's 26. No. From where? Birth. Birth. Right so, from birth. Some birth about, so if you, so just the healthy about, <laughs> I don't know. How, what does that look like? Yeah, right from birth, you're teaching them how you respect other people, how you listen to them, how you don't project your own stuff onto them. And right. if they do ask questions about, you know, sexuality, for instance, then you make it a really normal, natural part of life. Yeah. I remember um, my eldest when he was five, I think, yeah, it was his first year of school. And we'd always brought him up to know that mummy and daddy have cuddle time. And when mummy and daddy have cuddle time, it's a private thing because we just like to have lots of cuddles. And he understood cuddles and, you know, he could go and watch a video or whatever. You know, it was okay. And if he was going to interrupt cuddle time, you know, knock on the door for very normal for him cuddle time and he knew that when mummy and daddy had cuddle time we were making love and when we made love we made love for the whole family yeah makes sense to a, a small child yeah. perfect sense very logical very much within their world view right so he grew up with this he came home from school one day when he was five and he was like oh mom dad do you do oh, yes oh. you know like oh. and we were like yes that's cuddle time and the look on his face, he could not reconcile this beautiful, normal, loving thing that mum and dad do with this dirty, naughty, sordid, whoa, we've got a giggle, S. Right? Yeah. And I was so pleased that his first introduction to sexuality was cuddle time and not this whoa. Yeah, no, it's wrong. Did you, how did you, from that getting, so what was the mental connection then for him to go into, oh, it's actually okay, and then yeah. someone else perceives it as dirty, so he made that connection that it's different points of view, do you think, at that point? Well, I don't know if he did right then, but he was certainly very reassured when we had a chat about, yeah, that's cuddle time, you know, it's a really lovely thing to do, and, you know, when you're, um, you know, 
meet a lovely woman one day, you know, you'll be mummies and daddies and you'll be doing cuddle time. And it was just sort of a bit perplexed. What, like, what this other <laughs> yes, I could just say that whole visual. And, you know, and now 22, well, he's 22 now. And uh, it's quite interesting having a chat with him because we talk about sex a lot. I've got three children. Right. He's the eldest and the other two are teenagers. And he was saying to me the other day, because he had the same girlfriend from 15 until a year ago when she went overseas. Oh, wow. Yeah. University overseas. So the last year he's been um, having some fun, shall we say. <laughs> some of the stuff that he tells me about these girls and what they think sex is and what they think they should be doing to a man and the sorts of things that they think men would or wouldn't do, he's horrified. Yeah. He's horrified. He's like, Mom, I want you to know I'm doing good work out there. <laughs> <laughs> this is because so many of these girls have no concept of what a beautiful healthy interaction is yes. whether it's a one-off or something longer well this is this horrible story about that i've been like teens are doing like blowjobs in toilets and kind of this their way to kind of connect there's this whole kind of distorted mm. relationship that they need to give sex to boys or the connection yeah. I mean, I don't have a... It's worse than the patriarchy. It's worse than in the old days because in the old days, at least women weren't supposed to like sex so you just sort of had to sort of put up with it and pretend it wasn't happening. At least it was short and sweet, right? These days, oh, no, no. These days, women are supposed to act like high-class escorts and without being paid for it. Like, it's worse. All this empowerment that we've supposedly got and now everyone's just acting like high-class whores. Yeah, yeah. I well, mean, there's that... anything wrong with being a whore, by the way. You want to be a sex worker, that's fantastic. But you get paid for it. Paid it's for it. an exchange, right? So the girls now, are the teens now kind of, do you think they're going to revert into actually recognising that it might be cool to kind of pull back? And to, do you think that's coming? Well, into... hopefully if it's been modelled to them by their mother and their father, because where else are they going to get it from? Yeah, great. Right. So my 16-year-old daughter, who's been sexually active for the last year, we've had some talks, but not heavy-duty talks because it's too late for that. She's not a mum. Come, give me a oh, mum. Leave me alone. You know, give me a break, you know. But we've had enough, you know, firm grounding underneath all of that that I can just say, hey, Claude, how's it going with, you know, the boyfriend? And, you know, is he, is he respectful, you know? Is he showing you a good time? She'd be like... Mum, yes. You know, but I'm asking questions like, is he good for you? Yeah, good. Is he paying attention to, you know, hey, how, you know, how's your orgasm quotient, Claudia? And she goes, oh, mum. <laughs> but she's getting the mess. And that's part of my way of relating to her. But yeah. there's a lightness to it. Yes. Yeah, go And on. it is not fear-based. That's the other thing I really want to stress. I'm not saying to her, boys are dangerous, men are dangerous. You know, be careful, you know, like you've got to be strong because they're so dangerous. Yeah. No. yeah. I'm saying, Claudia, you're entering into what's potentially a beautiful thing. Yeah. It's yeah. emotionally challenging for both of you. You need to be kind of checking each other out in a positive way, not in a manipulative way. Right? I love that, this whole conversation around um, just for people who might be thinking of dating and, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, being over 40, I'm sure our audience is in that space, you know, just mm. um, it's great just to really look at it and reframe it and ask yeah. the right questions and thinking, and actually sit down and write what you want. I think that's a really great thing before you go out. What do I want yes. in a relationship? What do I want? Yes. What are my needs? What am I looking yes. for? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And ideally he'll do the same thing. And then you can sit down and go, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> But yeah. this is one of the key things that I do with women when I work with women is to get them to actually go, oh, who am I? What do I want? And when you do that, you start noticing all of the resistances coming up. Oh, I shouldn't want that. Oh, no, that's bad. Oh, no, I've got to put. And so many modern women will realise how they are still putting everyone else before them and then getting really resentful of their partner. <laughs> yes, yes. So true. It's funny because when I, um, I've been married 11 years, my second marriage, and mm -hmm. before I met him, I'd been, the, the relationship before was horrendous and he was psycho. But anyway, that was. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. And look, there are some genuine psychos out there. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah. so good. But what was interesting is after I went through that, I actually made a very deep conscious decision not to, to I'd prefer to be alone than be with the wrong person. It was a really yep. good decision. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. 
flow and I could feel it was great. But then when I wanted to meet my soulmate, I went, okay, these are the things I wrote. I literally wrote a list of do's and don'ts. Yeah. It was honestly, it was a tick box on every sense. And that's why I know that even though whatever happens, I'm still confronted with my own stuff in a mm. relationship with someone. But the list thing was awesome. It totally worked that, that what do I want, you know, so. Mm. Well, I always encourage people to do three lists. Oh, yes, tell me. So the first list is the list of the other, of the partner. What kind of person do you want to be with, right? And I want you to, dis to describe it in a way so that it's not a tick box so much, but it's more a felt sense, yes. that you have a felt sense of who this, you know, like his energy. Yeah. Because you might say, oh, I want him to be, you know, dark and big bustles. And actually you meet someone who's bald and kind of scrawny, but he feels right. Yeah. So you don't want to get too caught up in the details of it. Right. Yes? I did the same thing. It was very Yeah. Like you want to get this felt sense, okay? Yeah. So that's the first column. The second column is who are you in relation to this man? Ooh. And that's the most challenging. That's more challenging. Yeah. <laughs> what is it about you that's going to attract him to you mm. yes. right because there's an energetic thing going out this is me you can't mix too many women and men they just go oh, i want that yeah but there's nothing coming from this side so where's the attraction yeah. or worse still they'll say and women are particularly bad at this they'll say i want this perfect man yeah i want him to be rich and famous and and loving and all this and interested and blah 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 blah, blah. right i want that but what they're describing is so is someone who's actually not their energetic match. Mm. They're describing someone who's way better than them in a way, right? So what they're going to get, because we always get our match, we always get our energetic match. So if you're saying, I want this amazing person, but you're not amazing yourself, as most of us aren't, yeah, what you're going to get is someone who pretends to be amazing. You're going to get some kind of narcissistic kind of a guy. Yeah, and you're going to fall for that because in your mind you're like, I want this amazing guy. Oh, he's acting like this fantasy projection of mine. And you're going to fall for that. It's your fantasy projection that he's acting out. And then you're going to get to know him and chances are he's a bit of a narcissist because narcissists on the inside are actually really insecure and have to put up this big front to make them feel okay, right? And they want everyone around them to help them feel okay. And you're going to go like so many women do, oh, my God, he's a narcissist. How did that happen? I love that. That's so yeah. yeah. So this is why you need to go, well, who am I? Yeah. Who am I? Who am I to match him? Because you will get your energetic match, which will inevitably mean, sorry, people, he's not going to be perfect. <laughs> and it's so good because if you're for, like if you actually have to sit and go, well, who am I to make that match? You have to really resonate in that space of, loving and really work on yourself oh i love that That's awesome. yeah yeah it's really good and then the third part and this is really interesting as well we touched on it earlier the third thing is what kind of relationship do i want yeah because these days we can create any kind of relationship that we want mm. and particularly if you're doing it later in life because you're not looking for the father of your children you're not looking for the provider who kind of looks after you while you might be having children what, what are you wanting now in life? What kind of person do you want to be with? How do you want that? You don't have to live together even. Lots of people to, these days are together apart. Yeah? I mean, I don't live with my partner, <laughs> mainly because he, can't, <laughs> he doesn't want to live in a household full of my teenage children. I don't blame him. I don't particularly want to either a lot of the time. You know? <laughs> and there's no way I would want to live in a house if, if, if it was the other way around. Okay? They're getting better. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, it's kind of like, but that takes deep, hard conversations. Yeah. Yeah, it's not easy to go, oh, God, I don't want to live with you. If the other one's going, well, I do want you to live with me. You know, these aren't easy. Yeah. Right? It's real, like it's, it's real and things, mm. that's, that's the thing. I mean, certainly that I'm going into my own thing is about what's real for me and what's, yes. you know, learning yeah. about. And then yeah. the rules, you make it up as what yes. you might feel. And you also have to be open to what he's bringing to it as well because he will inevitably have different ideas, different concepts, different wants, different needs. So if he presents something that's different to you, yeah, so if I'm thinking, oh, I'd love you to come in and be part of my family with my beautiful teenagers, <laughs> and he's like, actually, I've got a nice place over here where I... <laughs> right? 
that was possibly not in my list of ideal relationship, yeah? So I can either go no, right? But if I want to say yes, because so much else of this person is very much feels right, yeah. I have to be able to really hear what that is. Yeah. yeah. I really have to get what's going on for him. And then he has to get what's going on for me in relation to that. So that together we can co-create something. Yeah, and no, I love that. Yeah, so that it's, the relationship becomes a constant co-creation. And that's what I feel too. It is like, because, um, you know, things just change and you always have to just check in. I know in my own yeah. relationship, it's a constant check in. Yes. And that's why I know doing work on myself is the only way that I can actually be okay. I mean, that's me, but yeah. I'm... You know, yeah, yes. And the better you get at this, see that sometimes people go, oh God, this sounds like so much work and tension and focus. And I'm kind of like, you know, it's a bit like if you want to get fit and healthy. At the start, it might seem like a lot of focus. It might seem hard. I can't eat these things I want to. I've got to go to the gym. I've got to, you know, because it's not actually part of who you are in your lifestyle. But as you become healthier, you just naturally want to eat the healthy food. You just naturally, your body's saying, let's go for a run. You don't have to force yourself. And so it is with relating. At first, you have to think a lot about, oh, God, how do I do this? And what's going wrong? And who am I? It does take a lot of, you know, intellectual and emotional attention. But you get better at it. So it becomes easier. And so you're just naturally living a relationship dynamic that flows. It is, and I can imagine with that whole, because you've been behaving a certain way yeah. for so long, and I know I'm thinking yeah. myself, <laughs> to it, and it is going to take some effort to go, okay, I'm yeah. not going to get triggered here. I'm going to see what's going on. That's nothing. Yeah. So I was even funny enough thinking about today going, God, um, we have so many stories around all our relationships we bring, mm -hmm. to, bring to relationship, the past, yeah. the beliefs. Yep. It's very crowded when you say one <laughs> sentence. So I love this. It's been very um, fantastic advice. And, mm -hmm. and tell people just what, um, so you've got, you do one-on-one -on -one sessions and couple sessions. Yes, I do. Yes. A great online course as well. Yes, yes. So I have online courses for men and for women. Right. Um, yep. So you can do that as well if you just want to learn in the privacy of your own home whenever you like. They're video based. So basically, it's a bit like this, actually. It's just me talking to you. And like, there's hours of stuff in there. I mean, anything you ever wanted to know is, is in there. Um, and I do women's workshops as well. So two day women's workshops, which are just fantastic to really everything we've been talking about feeling empowered as a woman, but strong yet soft at the same time. You know, not this. <clears throat> It's like, how can you feel your inner strength and be this beautiful person so you can pay attention to others? I love that because I know that's a big issue for women in corporate, you know, to kind yeah. of find that softness yeah. but strength in yes. self. Yes, yeah. And how as a woman you can use your sexual energy to, you know, help you with that, to help you with that inner strength and that outer softness. Yeah, the delicious. That's a great, and that's a great yeah. conversation because that whole thing of... Yeah. You don't want to, you know, because people go, you look like a flirty thing, but it's okay to have sexual energy. As oh, absolutely. It's vital because our sexual energy is our life energy. And if yeah. we deny our sexual energy, we're denying our life energy and we are flat. And then we get pissed off when we see other people who are happy. Yeah, <laughs> We get annoyed at our partner because they're happy and we're not. We get pissed off at her because she looks like she's got it all and I don't. It's, kind of it's actually there. You draw it up, right? Um, and then when he you know and then you can share it with your partner and it's a beautiful thing because when as a couple as individuals if you can combine your love energy so your love energy is this beautiful warm lovey dovey thing it's great and your sexual energy that's got a charge to it so when you can bring that into your love energy it's um, kind of like there's a bit of a zest there's a frisson to your love and then when you share that between you and your partner it's as, it becomes this unique frequency between the two of you it's, oh. it's that loving energy but it's got a little something extra right Beautiful. yeah and you can tell when couples have that yeah. yeah yeah you can get that but you need to be able to kind of merge the two and and share it so that's a lot of what i do once couples are you know are better at actually identifying who they are and the other is it's kind of like oh, how can we share this you know and a lot of it is just about creating safe space so you can share yeah. Because you can't receive that if you're blocked off to them. Yes. 
Definitely. Right? You can't just sit there going, I want something, I want something. I don't know what it is that I want, but I just want something from you. And he's like, well, well, I don't know. What do you want? I'll pinch your bum. You're like, no, 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 I don't want that. Oh, you sleazy guy. He goes, um, I don't know. What do I do? Do I buy you some flowers? Now, oh, God, are you trying to buy me off now? You know, like, you can't, it's like, defense, 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 defense. Yeah, right? Oh, that's crazy. And, yeah. And so when couples are ready for it, I really encourage them to do the couples retreat because in the couples retreat, we just learn so much gorgeous stuff yeah. about who, you know, you really learn how to relate to each other and you learn how you can infuse your, your life together, your love life, which is the whole of life with this potent connecting energy that combines the sex and the love energies. And it's, I mean, I love the, I love the retreats. And I guess this is one of the reasons why, I can do what I do because I'm constantly being recharged by it because I'm seeing the couples change and grow and, you know, reconnect. And it's the most beautiful thing. Yeah. It's the most beautiful thing. And I, you know, I'm just like really committed to doing what little I can because I'm just one person. I try and do my best. It's hard in our society because most people have no idea what I'm talking about. Right? <laughs> Everyone's kind of locked off in their little you know, boxes going, ah, oh, men, uh, women. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but when you when people do it, oh, it's just well, like. Well, you can know. see it in your energy, you know, because it always, the moment I met you, you just have that lovely joy. So, yeah, amazing. So what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll post mm -hmm. this out tomorrow and I'll put all your details so whoever's listening can yep. check out and check out your courses or come and see you. What an amazing experience and do your workshops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's fantastic. I'd love to see all the Mrs. V people there. Yes. You know, and we can share the love because literally that's what we're doing. We're sharing the love and you can only share love when you're open and strong. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yay, thank you. Well, thank you. I'm, I've learned heaps myself, so I, I'm, very, I'm very grateful. So thank you. I look forward to sharing this and, and getting everyone watching it as well tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Bye. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you very okay. much. Bye, Dave. Bye.